Hello, this is uh, Dr. Hu Shang Amir Ahmadi, a distinguished service professor at the Rutgers University and president of the American Iranian Council. In the video that I presented the day before yesterday, on Tuesday, I focused on certain conceptual matters that over time, specifically over the last 30 some years <clears throat> of doing a scholarship and being active on the policy side as well, in U.S.-Iran relations, I have developed for a better understanding of that relationship between U.S. and Iran, and come up with certain policy options for the relationship. In this particular video, I wanted to focus on the current stalemate, use those conceptual understandings to help you better appreciate the problems ahead and what might be expected to develop in the relationship. First, let me say that, as I said previously, <coughs> I do at times cough, so don't worry, please, about my coughing, my apologies. If it inconveniences you, it has nothing to do with corona. It's uh, an allergy. Second, again, as I said, this will be a very informal presentation. Um that is i am not going to read from a text or use teleprompter to deliver my thoughts i will simply speak my mind and my heart speaking from the mind and heart is the best way in my view to present these issues that are involved in U.S.-Iran relations, very complicated matters. As you all know, the United States and Iran have been a strange kind of a situation, a conflictual relationship for almost 41 years now. It developed after 1979 revolution in Iran, the Islamic Revolution that led to a theocracy, an Islamic Republic that is theocratic. I mean, that sounds strange that you have a republic that is theocratic, the first ever theocratic republic in the world. Most people don't understand this. I'm sorry to say that many, many people involved in U.S.-Iran relations, they're experts, top experts, don't understand this very simple fact that the Islamic Republic is not a normal state. It's a theocratic state, just like what church had back in the 12th, 13th, or 14th centuries in Europe. A theocratic state. And it sees the whole world, particularly the United States of America, from that perspective, from that lens, sort of. <clears throat> I explained what implication this theocracy has had for U.S.-Iran relations. Specifically, I shared with you uh, four ideas that I have come 
to develop and appreciate in U.S. Iran relations and use them to understand this relationship better and use them also to come up with certain policy options. If you recall, I'm sure you will, but the video is on the same uh, YouTube channel that I'm now speaking from. And remember, I'm coming to you on Tuesdays and Thursdays every week around 7 p.m. But the videos will be there for you to watch whenever you have time thereafter if you cannot see the live. <laughs> I said that uh, the first conceptual uh, issue that I came with was that the dictators that have diplomatic ties with the United States are sooner destroyed than others without that diplomatic ties. Yes, America does help dictators to come on in power, to power, and perhaps they also help them sustain that dictatorship for some time. But ultimately, this democratic America has proven over and over in the last many decades that it also destroys this very dictators that is promoted. America can't live with dictators for a long time. It's just a democratic country that cannot do it. Up to a certain point beyond that, it can't. The second thesis I came up with and shared with you was like, it's the other side of the same issue, that countries that do not have diplomatic ties with the United States have hardly become democratic in the past, again, many decades. I personally don't know any country that did not have diplomatic ties with the United States and have become democratic. If you know, I'd like to challenge you to show me. That doesn't mean that if you have diplomatic ties with the United States, you will become automatically democratic. Many countries haven't become democratic even if they are good US friends. But what it really means, that thesis, is that diplomatic ties with the United States is a necessary condition for democratization in developing countries but not a sufficient condition. These are the two T's. The third point I shared with you is this following, that for reasons that I explained, including this very two theses that I just shared, and the fact that the Islamic Republic is a, a theocracy, For those reasons and more, again, it's on the previous video, I said that the, this republic, the theocratic republic in Iran, from the day one that was established, made an assumption about the US. And that assumption was very a simple one. They just came with this idea that America is an enemy, that the United States is bent to destroy the Islamic revolution and this regime. And therefore, from the day one, they set with a policy that they continue to protect and preserve. The policy is, simply put, and no war, no peace policy towards the United States. I explained why the war doesn't happen in U.S.-Iran relations and that Islamic Republic doesn't want it because simply because the United States 
is too powerful for the Islamic Republic to fight. Simple. A fight between the U.S. and the Islamic Republic is just is going to end up in a destruction, defeat, and overthrow of that regime. Simple. Iran just simply cannot fight a war with the United States. I also said the incident with the U.S. also doesn't want that war with Iran. I explained why the last time. Very complicated, tough issue. But at the same time, the Islamic Republic didn't want and doesn't want peace with the United States. And peace here, I mean by a, a normal diplomatic ties. Again, as I said, the war doesn't mean actual fight. It means sanctions. It means use of force of all kinds political isolation and so on. But what the Islamic Republic doesn't want when it says war means real war, the fight, military encounter. That the Islamic Republic doesn't want with, with the United States. It doesn't want also peace, meaning it doesn't want a diplomatic ties with the United States. And therefore, the Islamic Republic's policy toward the U.S. has been to maintain the status quo that we have today of no war, no peace. I said also the last time that this particular status quo is, has also been unwillingly accepted by Iran's enemies, so-called, in the region and in the U.S. and in the Europe. They could not have the war because the U.S. wasn't prepared for it. And these other countries, Israel, Arabs, and others, didn't want Iran to have diplomatic, normal diplomatic ties with the U.S. And therefore, they prevented peace as well. And in that particular position, they took exactly the same position that the Islamic Republic had always had, that I don't want a peace either. So Israelis and Arabs and all of other the Islamic Republic's enemies really took the same position on peace that the Islamic Republic itself took. That I, want, I don't want a peace. And they said, they said, we don't want a peace either between you and U.S. They, they had tried to have war, but they had failed because the U.S. wouldn't do it. So everybody in U.S.-Iran relations settled with a no war, no peace status quo which exists today. I said also that to maintain this status quo, anytime the U.S. has gone, or this relationship has gone toward war side, more sanctions, more isolation, and uh, out of control, okay, and uh, the, the possibility for a real war, the Islamic Republic has immediately has jumped in, made compromises, negotiated, like the JCPOA, I explained the last time, the Comprehensive Plan of Action on the nuclear deal, and they brought the war side back to the middle. And any time the movement reversed from the war side toward the peace side, the Islamic Republic made it sure that it will stop in the middle, that doesn't go too far to the peace. After the nuclear deal, Iran, the U.S. wanted to go further to negotiate the, uh, you know, uh, missile stuff and Iran's involvement in the, uh, the region, the Middle East, you know, its attitude toward Israel and so on. Iran would say no. That's it. It has to stop there at the nuclear deal. Well, no war, no peace. They settled in the middle. But that middle has always been an, an easy middle. Because remember, the Americans unwillingly, out of no <laughs> option sometimes, settled with it. But it always wanted to move forward 
to a more comprehensive settlement with the United with Iran and perhaps to make peace in terms of developing a, a diplomatic ties. Again, Islam, the Islamic Republic will not do. The fourth point I shared with you last time was, from my perspective, as long as this no war, no peace status quo, is maintained either by the Islamic Republic or its enemies that there is no solution to U.S. Iran relations. They will always be there at times settled in the middle for, with certain negotiations and then after a while it goes back to the uh, to the war side. And therefore my fourth point was that the only way to settle this relationship once forever, to normalize it, is if the United States, the United States could take this no war, no peace option off the table, so then the Islamic Republic will not be left with that option. Iran will never take that off the table. Only the U.S. can and must, if it wants to normalize. That as long as no war, no peace is on the table, U.S. can impose any sanctions it wants. It can isolate the you know, Iran at any level it wants. It will never, ever get to where it really wants to get to. Either regime change, or behavior change. Most of the time, Iran misbehaved in the, from a U.S. perspective, and the many American government administrations have always wanted to change the behavior of the regime, meaning nuclear enrichment, meaning missile development, meaning intervention in the Middle East, supporting the uh, the, the radical Muslims, you know, being anti-Israelis, and so on and so forth. So, my fourth point has been and is that there is only one solution to a real peace, normalization of relation between the United States and Iran. There is only one way, one option, and that is if the United States could take or would take this no war, no peace status quo off the table, leave on the table only war or peace, and I mean it, war or peace. War here means real military war, conflict, or peace, diplomatic ties, either of the two. I recall when President Trump became, you know, president, you know, established his administration, I, before that, I had put together a few, a few of my colleagues, with the help of a few American colleagues, I put together uh, what we call a white paper for President Obama and his administration. In the white paper, this thesis was put to President Trump, uh, Obama. I said, if you wanted to settle U.S.-Iran relations, this is the only option you have, that you have to take war, to take no war, no peace off the table, leave on the table war or peace, and then give Iran all the incentives and assurance and trust it needs to build diplomatic ties with you, that is the U.S. Well, there is I said this is a no-lose option or policy formula because, as I said, the Islamic Republic will never take the war option with the United States. Will never. Why? Because I just can't fight it. We'll lose. And therefore, the only option 
that the Islamic Republic will be left after the no war, no peace is off the table, is peace. Because again, war will not be happening. They don't want that. Iran doesn't want that. But you know, <clears throat> the American administration never really took this thesis uh, seriously, or it, if, if it did, did take it seriously, it never really stayed with it. President Obama, toward the end of you know, his administration, took this option, came during the discussion on the nuclear issue, came on to public and said, very openly, he said, we really have no option with the Islamic Republic. Either we will go to war or we will settle with that enrichment, uranium enrichment problem. When Tehran faced that <laughs> clear choice, it took the negotiation, negotiated the nuclear deal. But the problem was this. Immediately afterward, President Obama forgot that it should stay there until it gets to the end. It wasn't just nuclear deal, that it had to push forward toward deals on missile, on Iran's misbehavior in the you know, region, support for uh, you know, Hezbollah and others. But unfortunately, Obama administration took that no war, no peace. I'm sorry, the, uh, took the no war, no peace, yes, back on the table. President Kerry, the, the Secretary Kerry, President Obama started talking as if they are done with Iran. They, they just wanted the nuclear deal and it's done. They really did not understand that that deal will not be sustainable. I said it from the day one when they started this negotiation on the JCPOA. I told them that would be a one to two years deal will not last. And it did not last. President Trump in fact, even President Obama had started to, uh, to make sure that, that it is not happy with that no war, no police situation that has developed after the JCPOA. But then again, it didn't take it seriously. President Obama came on board. His administration stayed with these nuclear deal for over a year and during that time tried to convince the Islamic Republic to return to the negotiation on other issues as well as some issues with the nuclear problem. Iran would say no, I am done. I am in the middle now. I have no war, no peace status quo achieved with you. I'm not gonna have to go either to the war side or the peace side. I'm, I am comfortable there. Well, President Trump withdraw from the nuclear deal. Started imposing a policy that is now called maximum pressure. Once more sanctions, more isolation, more threat of this and that. But the Islamic Republic will not take it, will not respond. No, I'm not going to negotiate. I am right in the middle of no war, no peace. And your sanctions or your threat of war or anything, you are not there yet. I know you, Mr. President Trump, you are not for it. So therefore, they just ignored him. <coughs> Again, they ignored him because the Islamic Republic had achieved what it wanted had moved the U.S. back to the center and didn't want it to go further. President Trump's maximum pressure policy wasn't really enough to convince Iran that, listen, if you don't, if you don't not negotiate with me, it could be we will be going toward the war side. They never said that. 
as President Trump was insisting, putting pressure, all kinds, on the Islamic Republic, it also, he also stayed, the administration also stayed with this no war, no peace status quo. That's where the problem came again. Back to square one. No war, no peace. The Islamic Republic would want it. And President Trump doesn't understand that that's what the Islamic Republic wants. It doesn't need to go to either side of that center. Until recently, President Trump started to perhaps reading my white paper. I think, I think Secretary Pompeo began reading my white paper and came with the conclusion that, listen, the maximum pressure, maximum isolation is not going to work. We need to go further. We need to go to a direction that makes the Islamic Republic really believe that there will be a war. And they started doing all kinds of stuff. They murdered uh, Iran's top general, Qasem Soleimani, in Iraq. And most recently, they have started taking Iran back to the Security Council in the United Nations, trying to reimpose UN sanctions on Iran again, which were lifted after the JCPOA, and extend or completely make it permanent the sanctions on import of military hardware by Iran from anywhere. Well, those are very serious challenges to the Islamic Republic. When the United States started talking about going back to the UN, to the Security Council, you know, imposing more sanctions and <clears throat> on the uh, military hardware side, extending that so-called UN Resolution 3122, which was sort of like a, a sister to the JCPOA agreement. Then the Islamic Republic began feeling seriously threatened just in the recent months. So what happened? Well, as I had predicted and as my thesis had predicted, the Islamic Republic started to thinking of going back to negotiation because they felt their status quo uh, is, is tough to maintain. President Trump is going toward the war side for this UN business and that they must make sure that that movement toward the UN is stopped. So a few things happen. First, and most importantly, Mr. Khamenei, the leader of the Islamic Republic, the top guy, you know, sends a tweet to his friends and others in which he says, the, the most heroic leader of, the, of Islam's history is Imam Hassan, the second Imam of the Shia sect of Islam. Well, why he is so heroic? He is the heroic man. He said because he made peace with his enemy, Mu'awiyah of the Umayyad dynasty or caliphate. Suddenly, Mr. Khamenei is now talking about the second Imam, not, not the third Imam Hussein that is famous for bravery and martyrdom and all kinds of stuff. But now his brother, older brother Hassan, 
is the most heroic, not the younger guy, Hussein, that was murdered in a war <coughs> with Muawiyah's son, Yazid. So that statement means to meant for the this radicals, the Islamic radicals that follow Khamenei, basically that to it was telling this radicals that be preferred. I am just about okay <laughs> to move in the direction of offering negotiation with the United States, Mr. Trump perhaps. That, that that move toward negotiation, he said, is heroic flexibility. Heroic flexibility. That in, as just like Imam Hassan, who heroically became flexible in dealing with Muawiyah, the enemy, now I wanted to get prepared to make to be flexible in negotiating with Mr. Trump, perhaps, or his whoever else, with America, to make sure that the the relationship doesn't move all the way from center to the war side, which has, in recent months, have been in those direction, in that direction. At the same time, he made his Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif to send a letter to the UN you know, Security Council, not actually to to the uh, Director General of the United Nations, basically asking him, first informing him that Iran is prepared to negotiate. To maintain, preserve the JCPOA, and also ask the UN chief to make sure that it talks to Mr. Trump and make Mr. Trump to be a little bit more reasonable and accepting of uh, a fair negotiation. Well. This two move, Khamenei is saying that I wanted to be heroically flexible until some time that I will be in a position not to be flexible. At the same time, foreign minister of Iran writing and saying, here we are, let's talk with no precondition. They also offered to exchange prisoners in Iran and the U.S. of people that they have. Now, here is the issue. As I said, and this is extremely important, the Islamic Republic is a theocracy. These theocrats, of course, have a military and a revolutionary guard that work for them, fight for them, you know, whatever repress people, everything. This theocracy is preoccupied, first and foremost, with its own existence. At any price, this regime wants to survive. At any price. To survive. Doesn't want it to go to war. And doesn't want it to go to the peace. Because in both sides, it doesn't survive. They want it to be a center. Now, that's the position of the theocrats today. But as Khamenei have tried to show flexibility for another set of negotiation with the United States, maybe with Mr. Trump or his replacement, I don't know. At the same time, Iran's revolutionary and military people, including the Revolutionary Guard, people in the army, and those who are support, supposedly 
patriotic, nationalistic, and so on. They are very frightened with this so-called heroic flexibility of Mr. Rouhani, Mr. Khamenei, and of course his government, that is Zarif and, and Rouhani, the president, for another set of negotiations. So, <clears throat> I believe while the theocrats are trying to offer the United States uh, a negotiation proposal, the radicals in the country are doing everything in their power to prevent that because they know, at least that is their understanding, that the next set of negotiations with the United States will mean that they have give up they have to give up all the enrichment whatsoever that they, Iran should have none and that they also would need to destroy certain number of their missiles and reduce powers in many areas and get off the uh, off the Middle East you know Syria Iraq and elsewhere that the Islamic Republic forces are that frightens the the, the radicals and uh, uh, the, the military people, including the Revolutionary Guard, they don't want to negotiate with the United States at a position of weakness. Because they think that Mr. Khamenei is offering this negotiation and Zarif from a position of weakness. Again, they are frightened by this, uh, the new sanctions and the UN action and so on. So the military said, no, this is not the time to negotiate. We need to wait a bit, resist a bit. They believe that the UN, they, after all, the United States is not prepared to fight it, to fight Iran. It just doesn't want it to a war with Iran, and therefore they sort of don't think that the war is going to happen. They think there will be more sanctions and more isolation and more pressure, and they think, I mean, they, I mean, the radicals, the military, the revolutionary guard, that they can, they can stand it, as Saddam Hussein could, for 12 years. But the theocrats don't want to take that, that uh, you know, risk. They think it's very risky uh, that for them, it's not important to lose missiles or give up on uh, enrichment and, and, and so on and so forth. They think differently. They don't think in terms of like, uh, uh, in terms of power and, and prestige and, and uh, you know, a, 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 more, uh, a, a more balanced uh, negotiation. They just want to, to settle in the middle with the United States. Give up whatever uh, is needed for the US to go back to the center. Now, because of this sort of conflict between the mullahs, the clergy, the theocrats, and this military people, <coughs> the mullahs have developed a series of incidents has caused a series of incidents most likely with the help of some powers outside to discredit the Revolutionary Guard and the military. The Mullahs had previously have made sure that the Revolutionary Guard becomes a terrorist organization by the United States and that it is under sanction, the rest of it. But that's a different issue. Now, the issue is not just that they want the United States to single out the Revolutionary Guard as terrorists uh, or, or to impose sanctions on them, but they wanted to go further. They really wanted to destroy the image of the Revolutionary Guard and the military globally regionally and particularly in the eyes of the Iranian people. 
So they, over the last three months, we have had two major incidents, so-called, that has involved the Revolutionary Guard and the military. The first was a few months ago when the Revolutionary Guard supposedly fired two missiles in Tehran airport area, hitting, destroying a Ukrainian passenger plane. Become a big issue. The, the moderates, the reformers, you know, the clergy, and they're all began talking about this is the kind of military people we have, this revolutionary guard. They can't even distinguish between an incoming missile and a plane that has just taken off from Tehran's airport. Well, that's a, that's a bad, bad image. So they began destroying the Islamic Republic, that is to say, this clergy and his supporters, its supporters, began destroying the image of the Revolutionary Guard. But whether Revolutionary Guard recovered from that or not, in less than three months, another incident happened in the Sea of Oman, this time for the military. I'm sorry, for the army, more specifically, Iranian Navy, which is a very powerful Navy, very well trained, knows what he's doing, probably the best unit of the Iranian military. And that one of the ships of this very force, Iranian Navy, fired the missile, hitting another ships of that same Navy, destroying it. This happened this week. Again, the image of one of the most important military units, the Navy, is destroyed internationally, regionally, and in the eyes of the Iranian people that who are these people? That's the Revolutionary Guard that cannot distinguish between an incoming missile and a plane going, just taken up, taken off. And here you have uh, another army unit that doesn't distinguish its own ship from the ship of an enemy or some other stuff. So that's the plan from the Islamic, the this, this, this uh, clergy side, because they wanted to sort of put the military down to open up the way for negotiation with the US. But, <laughs> but these people are not all that dumb. For example, the Revolutionary Guard came up and said, even if, one of our missiles hit this plane, we need to, to see what really happened behind the scenes. That perhaps the guy who fired was a traitor to the Revolutionary Guard. After all, the Islamic Republic never gave the name of that person to anybody. We still don't know who really fired. One, two, three persons. We never, we never know. And in fact, the Revolutionary Guard said, in the one hand, the regime declares air defense, complete preparation for that. But at the same time, it doesn't stop civilian planes from flying from the main Tehran airport. So you have a sky that is both civilian and military at the same time, at the same place. They think this was a, a plot to just create a situation where someone will hit the plane and blame the Revolutionary Guard. On the ship side, it's funny, 
Iran's military leader just came up to say that they think this missile was not fired from one of our ships against another of our own ships. Ship. It was an act of remote control, so-called electronic warfare that some country imposed on us. That somehow someone on this firing ship was again a traitor that was working with another force and some more lot perhaps to make this incident happen. Again, this is maybe too far-fetched. But that's what the military is saying. Basically, what they are trying to do in both sides, the Revolutionary Guard and the army, is basically saying that these are the work of our enemies. Again, they haven't openly said the United States, for example. But they really are trying to point to those direction so that it can they can prevent this negotiation this heroic flexibility that is emerging from the house of leaders in tehran so here is a serious struggle within the islamic republic between the hardliners and this uh, you know uh, the clerics who wanted to do whatever in their power to bring the situation back to the center, not peace again, to the center. But, and then the military rivals of them who basically say, we would rather prefer war or peace. And that's the key. The military in Iran prefers either war or peace, but because they know the United States will never fight a war with Iran, Therefore, their thinking is that if we stop negotiating with the United States in the months ahead, we may be able to force the Mullahs to accept peace, that is to accept a more normal discussion, a more comprehensive discussion. And this is extremely important because I believe uh, President Trump has made this military people believe that that could happen. That is a comprehensive negotiation toward normalization of relations. Indeed, when President Trump left the JCPOA, in a short speech, he made three important points. One, that as he leaves the JCPOA, it wants to negotiate with, the, with Iran, that the negotiation is on the table. He's not taking the negotiation off. And he said, but I want a comprehensive negotiation. He used the word comprehensive. Comprehensive negotiation towards settlement of all the issues with Iran. And he said, this comprehensive negotiation will be moved in the direction of normalization of relations with Iran. Normalization, meaning establishing diplomatic ties. And then he said the last point, if that happens, we will help Iran to build this economy and be a prosperous nation, just like it was before the revolution. It would be our partner, just like before the revolution. So that's the position that President Trump has taken. Let me remind everybody, I know many of the people out there don't like President Trump, particularly Democrats. But let me tell everybody that is listening, and those who may not listen now, but listen later, please understand this. Never before any president of the United States in the last 40 some years, 41 years after the Iranian Revolution. Never anybody has spoken in the same term that President Trump spoke 
I'd want a comprehensive negotiation toward normalization of relations and to help Iran build its economy. The word normalization of relations has been never spoken by any previous U.S. president after the Islamic Republic was established. None. President Trump is the first American post-Iranian Revolution president that has said that. And that's extremely important. I know he has lots of enemies, but I believe he is misunderstood. I have always said President Trump is the best opportunity the Islamic Republic has to settle this problem. And I continue to believe in it. Please understand, I'm not a Republican, nor I'm a Democrat. But if you look at my history of the last 30 some years in U.S.-Iran relations, you will see that, that we have always worked most of the time with Democrats. It was under the Clinton administration that the American Iranian Council was established in the first year of that administration. There is also another issue here, and that I really wanted to now speak to the Iranian side. I know the Islamic Republic is trying to negotiate with the U.S., but at the same time, in the bottom of its heart, it really thinks that its best option is not President Trump, but perhaps a President Joe Biden. Of course, they don't know what will happen to this next election. They most likely is going to drag the negotiation until this uh, election result is, you know, decided. But one thing the Islamic Republic also misunderstands, and this is something that the Republicans hide and don't want other people to know is this. Of the 100% sanctions on Iran, sanctions on Iran, starting with Jimmy Carter, President Carter, to today, I would say 70% of this killing, crippling sanctions on Iran were imposed by democratic administrations. And more specifically, Clinton administration and Obama administration is responsible for over, well over 50% of the sanctions on Iran, killing sanctions. And in fact, Republicans have a big mouth, a lot tongue, but when it has come to action, they really have been very good for the Islamic Republic. Very few sanctions they impose. Remember, the sanctions that President Trump has imposed on Iran are basically the sanctions that President Obama had imposed. President Trump just took those sanctions back on the table, which had been withdrawn after the JCPOA because of the nuclear deal. So very few extra sanctions Crippling sanctions have been imposed on Iran with President Trump or President Bush, the father, the President Bush, the son, or Mr. Reagan. None of them really match Clinton and Obama on the amount of the sanctions that they imposed on Iran. The Islamic Republic must understand, and that is key, moving forward with the United States, that when it comes to Iran, perhaps Republicans are better for a deal than Democrats. But more importantly, I may say, over the last 35 years that I've been, I've been in the U.S.-Iran relations, I can tell you that the U.S.-Iran relation is not, is not a party issue. It has nothing to do with, you know, Republicans or Democrats. They are both on the same side. 
with some policy differences. But it is not like the Democrats have the other branch and the Republicans don't. I could promise you that President, a President Joe Biden will be in fact worse for the Islamic Republic than another president called next year, Donald Trump. That's the history that we know. Again, this is perhaps another hypothesis that I have developed. Again, uh, my colleagues are all Democrats. They all know me. I love them. Nothing against them. I'm just trying to mend this relationship. I'm trying to help Iran understand it, those in the U.S.-Iran relation understand it. Many Democrats today, many Democrats today in the, in the Congress, elsewhere, they are talking as if, if they were in power instead of Trump, U.S.-Iran relation would have been improved. It's not, there would be a better relationship. Don't believe them because we have seen them in power. We have seen them in power. We have seen them what they have done when they were in power to you and the other nations. Don't, don't believe them when they are out of power. When they are in the power, you will see it's different. They are just playing a party game, party politics. Now that Trump is in power and they are out, they wanted to take over the presidency. They say anything. That's okay. <laughs> That's the nature of the politics. It's just a mean a process. It's funny. Now, this is very important. This is extremely important. Maybe this is another uh, thesis or, or, or at least is that a finding. That over the last 30 some years, I have learned this that when the American politicians, policymakers, when they are in power, they do and talk differently when it comes to Iran. But after they are out of power, they are 180 degree changed. I mean 180. That is the case with Republicans as well. It's not Democrats or Republicans, both. When they are in power, they say A, but when they are out of power, they say B. I say, my God, this guy, a Democrat or Republican, was so full of sanctions when he was in the White House, when he was or she was in the State Department. Now that someone else has taken over and this guy is out of business, now he has become pro Iran. Well, the simple fact is that many of these people, when they are not in power, they are in lobby organizations. <laughs> they make money. And they need, they need favor from someone out there. They change. Again, I am not saying that everybody is like that. They are very, very distinguished, honest uh, American policymakers who are not in power and they have they maintain the tremendous integrity. But there are a few that do not, unfortunately. Again, that's the way I have seen it. Remember, I have lived in U.S. Iran relations for 35 years. And everything I tell you now in the previous uh, tape and this one, believe me, is my academic understanding, not my policy, political statement. I have arrived at them through my scholarship in U.S. Iran relations and with my experience, the policy experience and writing. So believe me, what I say, you can take it. And I challenge anybody who will challenge any of the thesis, ideas that I have put to you in this two tapes. My hope, of course, is that the Iran and the United States will settle, that they go back to the pre-revolutionary 
as two partners. I have spent 35 years of my life, the best time of my life on this U.S. relation. And I will not give up. As long as that relation is conflictual, I will work hard until it becomes normal. I wish you a good time ahead, safe from Corona, <laughs> and I look forward to my next discussion with you uh, this 